Lori K. Soares Hacking was born on December 31, 1976, to a young biological mother who was only 13 years old at the time. Being too young, she gave Lori up for adoption. Four months later, Lori found her forever family with Thelma and Geraldo Soares, a couple from California who eagerly wanted to bring home a sibling for their adopted seven-year-old son, Paul. To Thelma and Geraldo, Lori was their angel baby, the answer to their prayers. Being Mormon missionaries, they raised Lori and Paul in a loving home filled with devotion to their religion and family. Thelma, who learned Portuguese, also taught her children the language to help them connect with and understand their father's Brazilian heritage. However, in 1987, Thelma and Geraldo divorced, as they had grown apart over the years. At the time, Lori was just 10 years old. Geraldo continued to live in California with Paul, who was graduating from high school and preparing for his missionary work. Meanwhile, Lori and Thelma moved to Orem, Utah seeking a fresh start. Initially, the transition was challenging for Lori, as she was very close to her father. However, with time, the wounds began to heal. It was in Orem that Lori's life started falling into place. She excelled in school and was considered a kind-hearted and outgoing young lady among her friends and family. Those who knew and loved her admired her ability to understand and connect with others. Throughout her academic journey, Lori maintained academic excellence while working a part-time job. She was a determined individual with clear goals and plans for her future. Little did Lori know that her fairy tale would unfold on a school camping trip in 1994. During a camping trip to Lake Powell with fellow Orem High School seniors, Lori crossed paths with Mark Hacking. Mark, known for his playful nature, was fooling around with his friends when he accidentally burned himself by tossing a smoldering log back into the fire. Coming to his aid, Lori treated his wounds and bandaged them up. From that moment, their love story began under the starry night sky and dying campfires as they talked late into the night. Lori couldn't help but share everything about Mark with her mom and never looked at another man in the same way again. Both being Mormon, Mark was preparing to embark on his missionary work in 1996 at the age of 20. Despite the distance, the couple maintained a loving relationship as Mark went to Winnipeg, Canada, to fulfill his duties. However, Mark's return was earlier than expected due to a scandal involving one of his roommates allegedly breaking missionary rules. Throughout this challenging period, Lori stood by Mark, and when he returned home, they picked up where they had left off. Lori continued her education at Weber State University, and after a year, she transferred to the University of Utah, majoring in business. During this time, Mark started taking on odd jobs in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, fate took a turn when Mark fell off a roof, resulting in several injuries, including a concussion, seizure, and broken back. This incident strengthened the bond between Lori and Mark as she cared for him during his recovery, bringing their relationship full circle. Mark enrolled in the University of Utah to pursue his undergraduate degree before pursuing a career in medicine. Later, Lori and Mark decided to take a significant step forward in their relationship. On August 7, 1999, they tied the knot in a temple ceremony in Utah. In December of the same year, Lori graduated with honors, earning a bachelor's degree in management. After getting married, the couple moved into an apartment complex where Mark took on a supervisory role, allowing them to live rent-free as long as they fulfilled management duties. Their relationship continued to grow stronger, with family and friends describing them as a deeply in love couple who worked harmoniously together. They were both dedicated to their goals while actively participating in their church and community. Lori shared Mark's passion for running, and they often enjoyed jogging together when they weren't occupied with work or church commitments. Lori secured a job as a stockbroker's assistant at Wells Fargo, while Mark worked as an orderly at a local psychiatric hospital while completing his studies. Over the years, Mark pursued his dream of attending medical school, interviewing with several universities, including the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. His hard work paid off, 
and he was accepted into the medical program at the University of North Carolina. Finally, their dreams were coming true, and they were ready to start the family they had always desired. However, Lori had to give up her job to support Mark's studies, so they made the move from Utah to North Carolina in July 2004. During this transition, Lori shared some exciting news. She was five weeks pregnant with her first child. After a decade-long relationship, their fairy tale life together was about to reach its full circle. They were about to embark on the greatest journey of their lives. On July 19, 2004, Mark woke up to find an empty bed. Assuming Lori had gone for a run before work, he called her office around 10 a.m., but was informed that she hadn't arrived yet. Concerned, Mark contacted her supervisor, who advised him to call the police and report her missing. Despite being told to wait 24 hours, Mark couldn't bear the uncertainty and began searching for her at Memory Grove Park, a popular spot for runners. As he continued the search, Mark contacted family members to inform them of Lori's sudden disappearance. Worried friends and family gathered at the park to assist in the search for the missing pregnant woman. Over a thousand people showed up, convinced that she had been abducted. Despite extensive efforts from family, church members, community volunteers, and the police, Lori could not be found. Her car was discovered near the park entrance, but there was no sign of her. Both the Hacking and Soares families held a press conference to draw attention to Lori's disappearance. Mark, visibly distraught, pleaded for information about Lori's whereabouts and her safe return. As the family sought media assistance, the police began focusing on those closest to Lori, hoping to uncover new leads. As is standard in cases involving missing wives, the husband becomes the primary person of interest. Mark was interviewed by the police, led by Salt Lake City Police Department Detective Kelly Kent. During the interview, Mark shared details about his marriage to Lori, emphasizing their happiness and understanding. He recounted the events leading up to her disappearance, explaining that she had gone for a morning run, and when he woke up, she was gone. Mark also revealed their plans to move so that he could pursue his medical career. During further questioning by Detective Kent, Mark revealed his intention to specialize in oncology, the study, and treatment of tumors. However, when asked to spell oncology, Mark struggled and couldn't spell the word correctly. While this raised some eyebrows, it didn't automatically make him a suspect. Investigators continued to interview individuals close to the couple, and their accounts aligned with what Mark had told them. Lori and Mark were happily married and excited for the next chapter of their lives. Despite their differences, they made their contrasting personalities work well in their relationship. Lori's co-workers also attested to the couple's sweet and intimate relationship. Meanwhile, investigators conducted an intensive search of Lori's car. They noticed that the car seat and rearview mirrors were adjusted for a larger person, suggesting someone of Mark's height had driven the car last. Furthermore, they discovered a receipt for a new mattress and linens purchased on July 19, 2004, at a nearby sleep and bedding shop. Upon interviewing the shop owners, investigators learned that Mark had been shopping at around the same time he called the police to report Lori missing. Mark was interviewed again but continued to deny any knowledge of Lori's disappearance. He reiterated his previous version of events to the police. When asked about the mattress, Mark explained that Lori had an accident and they had disposed of the old mattress a week earlier. He mentioned they were currently using the old box spring until they could replace it. While it seemed plausible that Mark had bought a new mattress for their upcoming move, the timing appeared suspicious. Nevertheless, Mark was released as all the evidence was purely circumstantial. Around 2 a.m. on July 20, 2004, the police received a call from a Salt Lake City motel regarding a man running around naked and seemingly screaming. When the police arrived, they found Mark hacking, naked except for his sandals. It was reported that Mark had visited the motel earlier and consumed alcohol heavily before ingesting barbiturates and engaging in erratic behavior. Instead of arresting him, the police contacted his family, and his brother Scott came to take him home. On Mark's palm, 
his brother discovered a peculiar note that read, to everyone, from Mark, this is justice. I'm so sorry. Law enforcement didn't believe Mark was genuinely insane. They theorized that he attempted to feign madness as a last-ditch effort to elude capture. The fact that he still wore his sandals hinted at his charade, an opinion supported by renowned FBI profiler Candace DeLong, who noted that individuals experiencing psychosis typically do not keep their shoes on. Eventually, Mark's family admitted him to the psychiatric ward at the university for observation. As investigators pieced together the puzzle, they uncovered that Mark had been leading a double life. Mark was born on April 24, 1976, to Dr. Douglas Hacking, a respected pediatrician, and his wife Janet, a nurse. He was the fifth of seven siblings, known for his pranks and occasional accidents for the sake of laughter. It came as a shock to investigators and his family that Mark was not enrolled in the medical program at the University of North Carolina, as he had claimed. Furthermore, it was discovered that Mark hadn't even obtained his undergraduate degree from the University of Utah. He had failed in 2002. He had been pretending all along, even staging a mock graduation with media coverage. As the media became more invested in the investigation, further lies from Mark's past came to light. Reports surfaced alleging Mark's involvement in activities inconsistent with the principles of a devoted Mormon. There were accusations of smoking, consuming alcohol, and engaging in intimate relationships with some of the girls he had recruited into the faith, suggesting a scandal that had led to his early return from missionary work in 1996. The investigators were on the brink of uncovering the shocking truth about how much the apple had strayed from the tree. Armed with a search warrant, they initiated a thorough search of the couple's shared apartment. Detective Cantu immediately noticed several discrepancies. Inside the apartment, they found Lori's purse, wallet, and car keys, which was unexpected since the car keys should have been missing since the vehicle was found at the park. Lori's wedding ring was safely stored in her jewelry box, and the bathtub appeared to have been meticulously cleaned with bleach. Another intriguing discovery was a large bouquet, which Detective Cantu suspected was purchased as a reconciliatory gesture after a couple's fight. As they continued searching, they stumbled upon a letter addressed to Mark from Lori in the second bedroom. The contents of the letter revealed Lori's contemplation of leaving him, expressing her dissatisfaction with their current situation. She expressed her desire to grow old with him, but mentioned that she couldn't continue under the existing conditions. She conveyed her unhappiness about coming home from work and the strain it put on their relationship. Further investigation unveiled a brand new mattress that seemed untouched, with freshly unwrapped bed sheets. Additionally, a hunting knife with traces of hair and fibers was discovered in a bedside table drawer, along with a fingerprint and a small blood stain. The investigators extended their search to Mark's SUV, where they found a blood stain on the back seat and handprints near the back door, indicating the handling of a heavy object. The knife and blood samples were sent for testing, leading the police to suspect foul play and potential homicide. However, they chose to keep their suspicions confidential and focused on establishing a timeline leading up to Lori's disappearance. Information from the University of Utah Psychiatric Ward revealed a man disposing of a large item in their dumpsters, but unfortunately, the dumpsters had already been emptied, complicating the search for evidence. It became apparent that Mark had been using dumpsters to discard potentially incriminating items, prompting the investigators to explore the area behind the church attended by the couple. There, they discovered the discarded old mattress, although the top cover had been torn off. The case took a significant turn when the blood found on the knife and in Mark's car matched Lori's DNA, however, without her body, the prosecution lacked a strong case. The focus then shifted to searching municipal landfills, with specialized teams conducting thorough searches based on new information obtained after suspending the volunteer search. The timeline didn't align with the discovery, as the mattress would have been removed if it had been dumped a week earlier. Investigators then reached out to Lori's colleagues at Wells Fargo, who shared an intriguing piece of information. 
They revealed that Lori had made distressing calls regarding financial aid from the university, appearing visibly upset before leaving the office in tears. However, when the couple attended a farewell party hosted by her friends later that evening, Lori seemed to be in good spirits. Detectives decided to review surveillance footage from a convenience store, which showed Lori and Mark shopping on Sunday evening, a day before she went missing. The store clerk, Eric Holloman, confirmed their presence and shared a conversation he had with Mark, who discreetly signaled him not to inform Lori about his smoking habit when her back was turned. Holloman noted that Mark appeared happy, while Lori seemed down. In a puzzling turn of events, Mark returned alone to the convenience store around 1.30 a.m., raising suspicions about his potential involvement in the crime. Meanwhile, the police received new information indicating that the blood found on the knife and in the car matched Lori's. This vital information was kept confidential until Mark's release from the psychiatric ward, where he sought treatment for his emotional breakdown. During this period, Mark sought legal representation from defense attorney G. Gilbert F.A. On August 2, 2004, Mark was arrested under suspicion of the aggravated murder of his wife, Lori. The public soon learned that Mark Hacking had become the primary suspect in the murder case. Mark's father, Douglas, confirmed this in a statement to the media. He explained that on July 24, 2004, Mark's brothers, Scott and Lance, confronted him while he was undergoing treatment and emotionally broke down, confessing to everything. Mark alleged that Lori had discovered his trail of lies when she inquired about student housing and financial aid from the University of North Carolina. This confrontation occurred on July 16, 2004, the same day her co-workers reported her emotional distress and early departure from work. Mark fabricated a story about a computer glitch causing his application to be delayed, leaving a message with the university to address the issue. However, it wasn't until Monday that Lori could get a response, only to discover that Mark's entire life was a fabrication. Mark claimed that their relationship managed to weather the storm, despite the strain caused by the incident. However, he felt offended by Lori's criticism after finding her letter confronting his actions. Feeling further insulted, Mark retrieved his 22 caliber rifle, left the note in the spare room, and proceeded to the master bedroom, where he fatally shot Lori in the head. He then wrapped her body in garbage bags and carpet, placing her in the back seat of his SUV. Mark tore off the top cover of the mattress, cleaned up the evidence, and packed everything in more garbage bags. He tied the torn mattress to the roof of his SUV and loaded all the evidence, along with Lori's lifeless body, onto the back seat. At the university, he disposed of Lori's body in garbage bags, and at the church, he discarded the mattress. Mark revealed to his brothers that these actions were an attempt to cover up the crime. Douglas expressed his belief that Mark experienced a psychological breakdown when Lori uncovered his deceit. He felt that Mark faced immense pressure due to their family's reputation and standing within the community. On August 9, 2004, first-degree murder charges were officially filed against Mark. After a month of painstaking search efforts in the landfills, Sergeant Jar Nelson of the SLLCPD discovered hair and a portion of Lori's jawbone. Eventually, the majority of her remains were found and sent to the coroner's office for examination. The medical examiners were able to identify her through dental records, although the exact cause of her death, or whether she was pregnant, could not be determined due to the advanced state of decomposition. As a result, they were unable to charge Mark with the death of the unborn baby. The discovery of Lori's body significantly strengthened the case against Mark, according to Salt Lake Deputy District Attorney Bob Stott. Scott, Lori's brother, expressed relief, stating that it was a great day for the family, knowing that Lori's final resting place would not be at the bottom of a landfill. On October 29, 2004, Mark initially pleaded not guilty to the first-degree murder charges. However, when Lori's brother, Paul Soares, pleased with him to spare his family the additional grief by pleading guilty, Mark had a change of heart. On April 15, 2005, 
He changed his plea to guilty in exchange for prosecutors dropping the additional charges against him. On June 6, 2004, Mark received a sentence of six years to life in prison under Utah law, with an extra year added to his minimum term due to the use of a firearm in the killing. In July 2005, the Utah Board of Parole denied Mark's parole eligibility until 2035, requiring him to serve a minimum of 30 years. The news brought relief to Thelma Soares, Lori's mother, who viewed the initial six-year minimum sentence as an insult to Lori, her unborn baby, and their family. The change in the minimum sentence renewed her faith in the justice system. Eventually, Lori's family removed her married name from her tombstone and replaced it with the Portuguese word Felinia, meaning little daughter. In response to public outcry over the initial five-year minimum sentence for felons convicted of first-degree murder, Utah House Bill 102, also known as Lori's Law, was passed on March 20, 2006. The new law established a 15-year minimum sentence for those convicted of first-degree murder before being considered for parole. On June 6, 2005, Mark's father, Douglas, released their final statement to the press, providing clarifications on several events leading to the confession and conviction. The statement concluded with a quote from Mark, expressing his acknowledgement of his actions and his hope to one day become the man that Lori always wanted him to be. In June 2006, Utah prison officials discovered that Mark had been selling personal items, including signed autographs and hand tracings, on an online site called Murder Auction. Mark agreed to stop selling these items online after being caught. Perhaps the most disturbing aspect of this case is the murder of a woman by the man she loved and trusted in marriage. Despite their vows to honor, protect, and be honest, Mark was never the man Lori believed she had married. 